Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. This week, I'm lucky enough to chat with composers Jacob Yaffe and Rowan Halton about their work on the YouTube series The Age of AI, produced, hosted, and narrated by Robert Downey Jr. We discuss how they each bring their own musical specialties to the project, how they landed on an orchestral acoustic sound instead of the expected bleeps and bloops. We talk about the use of computers in music making, what they think of the series, and much more. It's a great interview, and I hope you enjoy. Well, thank you both so much for uh, for making time today. I really appreciate it. I've gotten to watch the first episode of the YouTube series so far. Uh, which, while I am still terrified of Skynet, uh, it's nice to see a series that that focuses on stuff like uh, prosthetic limbs and how us being weird about this frequently might screw us out of the solutions we need to stuff, or just be needlessly cruel to people. Of you know, I'm creeped out by robots, therefore that guy shouldn't <laughs> have a hand. Is a really weird stance to take, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. One of the things that interested me, uh, and they touch on it in the first episode is that I think for a lot of us, our experience with any kind of machine learning or something like that, um, it, it, someone, it, we may not realize it, is like my lifetime of, of musical advancement has been mostly, uh, you know, a reverb filter getting better. Uh, the Casio keyboard I had as a kid, you know, and then, and then seeing GarageBand come out years later and going, well, that's a huge jump in faking a guitar sound or, or faking a certain amp or something like that. And knowing that those are all um, software changes, you know, that's that is AI assistance a little bit uh, in enhancing mm -hmm. what I can do. Um, I think when I was in high school, there was uh, White Town was the band by band. I mean, one guy in a, an apartment with a bunch of synths. And, uh, and mm -hmm. it, I remember reading a Billboard magazine about how. Uh, you could hear the the fear in in the kind of record label thing because this guy just did this and the internet was really brand new and he he just got it out there no label and it it freaked people out and uh one of the things he talked about was how difficult it was to get the drums to not be perfect because the computer really wanted the drums to be dead on the beat and it and he you know he wanted it to sound more natural than that watching this episode as as musicians uh or or doing this project as musicians, um, what was it like for you uh, in, in terms of, of your own interaction with, uh, you know, the, the whole being replaced by robots or, or being assisted by robots or what constitutes originality? Uh, how did, how did the series kind of land for you as musicians when you took the project? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I mean, in, in music production in general, that is the the perfection, the perfectness of the computer with quantiza quantization in the sequencers has been a challenge for uh, 20 years. And then we have the explosion of virtual instruments just in the last 10 years, where you have the most incredible sounding string samples, guitar samples, all these things that at your fingertips and everything sounds so perfect that they have this new phrase in the film music world. They say, Oh, it sounds too synthy. And it's the perfection actually makes it sound fake. So the new sample libraries are trying to find ways to add in the mistakes, the out of tune, the little squeaks when you hear, you know, the, one of the string players knocks into the stand or something. Like <laughs> you want the rough around the edges when, Ron and I working in the studio, we're using uh, analog synths and stuff. We love the real instruments because you can add in, you know, the out of tuneness. You know, I love recording um, the Arturia Matrix, Matrix. Matrix Brute is awesome when you first turn it on because it's warming up, and so you, as you're playing it, it's tuning itself, <laughs> and that out of tuneness is just awesome. And uh, the Prophet 12, actually, you can add in, they call it, there's a flop filter, and it just makes it out of tune. And it's just funny that we have these tools, and we're actually having to learn how to play 
the the sloppiness and that's kind of where we're trying to live the humanness of it all um so that's you know just in general in music we're dealing with that on every project and then with this it's hitting you in the face that humanity in general is struggling with it um we actually have a filmmaker friend uh zev learner he had a um he had a great way to describe it that um Right now, audiences were just inundated with perfection uh, from movies, television. You think about a $300 million Marvel film, Mm -hmm. the CGI is just absolutely incredible. Um, And most things are that nice. So people crave homemade, the DIY. Everyone, you know, YouTube uh, creators are getting like crazy numbers because people are looking for that realness. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we thought about all that kind of stuff, but this, you know, Rowan can probably back me up here. We were both kind of blown away by the series because it, it, we thought it was going to be a lot about robots and terminators and all that. And then you end up discovering, <laughs> yeah. wow, these yeah. scientists are using it for amazing things. There's, there's this, there's this whole idea, right? The fear comes, and we've been talking about this, a fear of annihilation, right? Like there's this idea that, you know, machines will make us obsolete. And obviously every science fiction movie for the last 40 years um, has these warnings about, you know, like Elon Musk says, summoning the demon. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have these concepts or this concept that um, creating something that may be more intelligent than us will make us irrelevant. Um, or, you know, we'll be the, we'll, we'll be a, uh, the old iPhone, if you will, you know, <laughs> they're, at, they're at iPhone, they're at iPhone X will be iPhone four or the iPod, you know what I mean? Like just out of date. But the truth of the matter is like, like we've been just saying, there's, there's a longing for the things that only human experience can bring. Um, and I want to add on one more point to this. It's like, you can, you can think about it in the context of auto tune, right? Like for the longest auto tune was shunned. You know, like people yeah. like, yo, never use auto tune. I'll never use it. And now, as far as pop music is concerned, um, it is a sound, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's almost, it's almost like a compressor or EQ. It has become a character of the voice, um, not just a, a, you know, a tool to enhance the voice. And I think that's the same thing we're talking here on a larger context, that as we use these tools, they'll be so integrated in our everyday life experience that it will become its own mixture, its own hybrid um, creation. And I don't necessarily know if that's to be afraid of. It's unknown and being, you know, it's, there's often a fear of the unknown, but helping, you know, helping create and tell this story, um, it ease a lot of my, my fears, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the auto tune thing actually brings up something when I was researching for this interview, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, I remember reading an article after after Share and after Autotune became like, oh my gosh, that's a thing. Uh, that that there were a lot of you know producers in Nashville going, yeah, Autotune. You're never supposed to crank it up that high. You know, it, it's never supposed to be that obvious. And and you know, keep it hidden, keep it low. You know, just touch it up a little. But that that it wasn't like an unknown thing, but adopting it as an acceptable sound and not hiding the machine's hand in this. Like where you you know where you got assistance from a computer, uh, wasn't you know it was a change in in listener attitude of of what we would right. mm-hmm. what we would take, and uh, exactly, and and I feel like that's a that's a lot of what the series is is about. You know, there's going to be some some changes in attitude of that fear of of annihilation, not just on the big scale of like the Matrix or something, but but you know even small scale, just replacing you at your job. Uh, you know, the, that it might be a little bit scary. Uh, a, I'm a big fan of that show, Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah. And I can't remember what season it is, but uh, they're being interviewed on television. And the, um, the character, Jared, uh, was trying to describe, you know, the challenges they were facing with the Internet and bandwidth. And uh, he, he likened it to um, late 1800s, uh, early 1900s the most cities were just being filled with manure and they just had no idea how to deal with the amounts of horse manure that there were, that were coming into the cities every day and the massive amounts of people coming in. And they just were like, we can't, this isn't livable. And they said, we have to do something about this. Everyone's trying to come up with a solution. And then the automobile started being mass produced by Henry Ford. 
and completely revamped the whole thought process. Manure was no longer a problem. People were using motored vehicles and, and uh, public transportation. And so he was saying that, you know, in the mythical world of Silicon Valley's show, that their their solution was the automobile. Uh, and I think that a lot of the fears about AI can be thought of in similar terms, that we're all afraid because the weights and balances that we currently live with are going to be completely different once AI becomes more uh, a part of our daily lives. And we'll just, we'll just flip. We'll just, we'll just think and act differently. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think often we forget that sci-fi novels and stuff are not dry academic examples of, of what, you know, here's every possibility. They're dramatic things written for, right. for, you know, big climaxes and drama and stuff. So that's always going to go with fear uh, and, and the, and the doomsday mm-hmm. scenario. It gives you a great third act. Uh, yeah. It's hell. But, but I, I was talking to someone the other day about, we were talking about the four minute mile and someone just, I think in the last year broke the two hour marathon. Uh, and both of those were physically impossible. Like, like man will never do it. Uh, like, like humankind would, your skin would tear off your body or something, you know, it, it, it would kill, it would kill us all. <laughs> and, and once it happens mm-hmm. now people will do it. Now it's, it's going to happen. Right. Uh, or the, the fifth element, there's the, the, in the film, there's the operatic scene, uh, and it's an alien character and the thing that she sings, uh, there's an interview with the, I can't remember the composer's name, but there was an interview with the composer that Sarah, he, Sarah. That, that he purposely wrote it uh, or that they purposely wrote it for, it was supposed to be out of the range of what a person could sing or, or so they thought. Right. And then the person came in and did it and, or, or did, did more of it than they thought was within the scope of just, Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and, and I feel yeah. like we're going to surprise ourselves in a four minute mile kind of way where, you know, I mean, I, I came up listening to songs that I didn't understand. Someone did, 30 takes in the studio and cut their verses together to rap that fast or to, to sing that fast. And uh, you don't know what they're doing. So some kid out there is just going to figure out how to actually do it. And then what are they going to do when they go into the studio and get 30, you know, things just get crazier. And I I feel like we miss that assistance part when we're looking at just the doomsday scenario. There's a a really uh, incredible, there's a couple of, Oh, (laughs) Yeah, there, 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 there's a, a couple of examples of this thing, um, of what you were just saying. I think specifically as it related to food growing, um, and you, you kind of alluded to this when you were talking about isolating, um, isolating the AI function to a doomsday, you know, focus, right? But like, you don't think about how these tools will literally, literally enhance the way that um, we're just able to live, right? So they, you know, they're talking about growing food and using different types of chemicals to have different options to create healthier versions of food or more options for healthy food. And it's like, kind of like you're saying, like, we can't imagine that, right? Like, you don't necessarily imagine a scientist putting, you know, paste, uh, paste of tomato mixed with the texture of ice cream um, just to do it. Um, but when you see the options, just like the two minute mile, then you never know what, um, we as humans can kind of create with the assistance of AI. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As far as, as y'all's collaboration and, uh, I, I know Rowan, you've got a, a, a hip hop and, and songwriting production background and Jacob, you've done more, uh, well, I mean, you went to the NYU film scoring program. Can you talk about, um, uh, I feel like it would be different. A project like this, it would be maybe difficult to not go with the hot take of of the most electronica sounding thing ever because hey, it's AI and and this, you know. Can you talk a little bit about getting past that first impression and what you wanted to do uh, for this project? And and if you can a uh, a little bit, I I know y'all scored Free Meek as well. I would think it'd be a little bit different trying to do something similar, not a hot take on it, and and get your your deeper idea going uh but particularly when when that's got someone else's music at its core a little bit uh Mm -hmm. as far as uh, yeah as coming up with your own thing and not just going off the the first thing how do y'all get deeper into the project together when we first got asked to um demo for the for the show 
uh, I brought on, it, the, the pitch was, we want this to be a mixture of E.T. and Stranger Things. Um, you'll see in later episodes why. And, of course, a series like this, they're, they're, not, they're not filming any of it in order. They're just going and interviewing people all over the planet. Um, <clears throat> and we were really excited. I love John Williams, and the E.T. score is one of the best scores ever created. Uh, we're huge fans of the music from Stranger Things, and we thought this is going to be so cool. Uh, so we started writing, and they put it to picture, and it didn't work. They, uh, it just felt very obvious, felt very forced, and it, you know, that the on-screen stuff that was happening was already very techy and very, a lot of techno babble, if you will. Um, just so it's just kind of like you know um my wife's a writer and she calls it in, an info dump <laughs> where you're just trying to dump lots of story and lots of information on the audience so they can just kind of catch up um so we had to actually restart um from scratch and build much more organic music uh it was you know we, we say we had to combine the electric and the acoustic rowan's background um in song production, pop production, all that is incredibly useful, um, especially on something like this, because we would take, you know, kind of chamber string ideas, um, acoustic guitar, piano, just elements, and then work with him on producing it. He would have ideas that uh, would bring in like just a little riff or something, and we'd develop that into a, a more orchestral thing. So there was this actually forced us into places we'd never been musically because it's such a wide ranging uh, palette for for music. We needed we did need hip hop, we did need rock, we did need pop. We also needed straight up classical stuff, country sounds. It just went everywhere, uh, and they needed it fast. So uh, <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was a, a great learning experience uh, for us, but it was definitely not an easy target. In in terms of uh, of how y'all's collaboration first got together, uh, can you talk a little bit? I mean, I know Rowan, you, Houston to Tulsa, and and uh, Jacob, you've got New York to LA. How, it, where did y'all meet up, and and how did it? How did you know that it was going to click professionally to to hit deadlines together? Oh yeah, that's that's a that's a good way of of, of framing that question. So. Um, Jacob and I, we met um, on a music business, um, kind of like a retreat slash conference um, called Reality Music, it was in Israel, and it, you know, we just had great conversations, just vibed as friends first, and I was working on a couple of projects back home, and I was like, man, it would be real cool to combine our sounds, and mind you, we hadn't, we had never really worked. Um, but I just know I knew his orchestral background in the pop world would just be really cool um, to try some new experimental things. Um, and and there wasn't any specific pop projects, but then I got asked to to do a, a independent film, um, and I thought that was been, been the perfect project for us to connect with. So we connected and, and did some work on that, but that didn't end up working out. Um, but then Jacob brought me in on a Gap commercial, um, and featuring Janelle Monet, so it was kind of like the perfect foray for both of our skill sets to kind of be put on display. Um, and it also was my entrance into exactly what you said, meeting deadlines. <laughs> so um, it went really well. The music came out great. Um, and just the process of, um, you know, when you have two music creators, a lot of times there are redundancies, but because of how we create, um, there's a lot of things and ways of thinking about music that neither one of us would do on our own. So it, you know, it literally comes out with this, um, this third version, if you will, that's where we get our company name third string. Hmm. Um, it's, it's just a whole nother way of looking, um, and approaching music than we, we would each do on our own. Um, and as the project has, has, as the project, excuse me, has evolved. Um, so as our process, and we like to say each project is its own universe. Um, but I think what fundamentally makes it work is our approach. Um, we're open to basically throwing paint at the wall until we find something great. And usually our best um, and most productive work is when we're sitting side by side, literally co-composing 
Um, and those often, the people who are employing us, they like that, those pieces the best. It never fails. They'll send something out and something, and they'll be like, hey, what, is, what happened to that other thing that you guys did? <laughs> and so mm. it, it's, it's, it's been definitely a work in progress, but where we are now, like we're, we're making some of the best music of our lives um, collectively. And this is what y'all's what, fifth, fifth collaboration? Uh, yes, because we're working on our six <laughs> now, right? Yeah. Uh, so I when y'all, fifth, yeah, when y'all are side by side or, or composing together, um, is that is that on piano or literally? What do y'all wear? Or, or are y'all just sitting down to? I mean, I'm, I'm imagining just staff music sure. from or staff papers yeah. from, from music class. Yeah. Well, we meet in the in our studio, um, and I have. Uh, several synths and keyboards and an old hundred year old upright. And, uh, then there's a, a keyboard actually built into the desk. So we'll, um, sometimes he'll sit at a piano and I'm sitting at the computer or vice versa. And, um, we talk a lot because a lot of these, you know, we're on set at each project is its own universe. So before we start even writing a single note, we talk about what's going to make this project unique, what elements, you know, I mean, it can even just start with what kind of instruments uh, we want to do. And, you know, being that the show, these are based on shows or films, the, the filmmakers come to us with um, usually something, um, you know, like even, even free meek. Uh, it took a lot of um, experimentation to land where we were, we thought, oh, you know, Meek's music would make it easy. We just follow that path. But we ended up having to um, counter that because his music was so big and high energy mm -hmm. and we needed a lot of other types of things. Uh, but they all had to kind of lead into and set up those moments. Um, so we'll, we'll be sitting there side by side and we'll, we'll play ideas and we'll, the other one person will respond to it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Let's loop that or let's, let's bring that up, you know, a minor third or you know, we should go to this chord next, or that's a really great melody. And what's really great is when you're composing by yourself, often we throw out really great ideas. Oh, that's not good. That sucks. But when the other person's there, they're like, no, you're crazy. That was great. Go back to that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and when we're producing together, that it really helps too, just because you're getting kind of immediate feedback from another person in the room. Um, you know, much like I can imagine a band jamming in a, in a room together, um, that's kind of like what we're doing. It's just customized music for a project or, or to picture. So there's a lot of boundaries that we have to work within. I want to, I want to add one thing too. And I, and I think we never really speak about this, but I think one of the best parts of collaboration is the stuff um, that's outside of the music. Like this, for instance, what we're literally doing right now, it's very, very, very cool to have, you know, somebody there that you can throw ideas on how to, you know, navigate um, this crazy business, especially what's going on right now in our business. Um, that's that's one of the, the most beneficial parts, just, um, just having somebody there that you can throw ideas off that enhance the music, right? And that get your mind prepared um, to create music. Because when we're creating this amount of music and working on this many shows, um, you know, life, life is life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's always cool to be able to say, Oh man, let's, let's figure out how to change our frame of mind so we can get in the right place to deliver um, like we need to. Um, and then, yeah, just navigating Great. the business and, and, and <laughs> sending emails, something as simple as sending an email. <laughs> yeah. That's always cool. Like, what, yeah. should I say this? Am I crazy? <laughs> <laughs> No, man, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot uh, aligning our energies and making sure we're in the right uh, spirit, frame of mind to match, um, you know, because music is really subjective. One person loves Megadeth, and the next person absolutely <laughs> hates it. Yeah. Um, but there are times that, you know, Rowan comes in, he's like, man, I just heard this great track. Go pull this up on YouTube. He's like, I listen to the bass, you know, and he's like, what if we combine that with that crazy piece of music you showed me last week? And that's the the part that uh, no single per you know composer could do on their own because you mm -hmm. only have your own experiences and your own feelings and how you react to to picture. So um, 
it's it's been really 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 great like for instance on the ai um show one of the challenges we had was actually robert Downey jr um when we worked on the series probably five six months before we ever had his voice in the series or saw him on screen um he's one of the i mean someone told me he's like one of the top five most in-demand busiest actors on the planet right now and so scheduling him to film even when he is as involved with the project as this actually getting him in the studio to film him Mm -hmm. is very very difficult to schedule so um we did finally get him of course everyone was thrilled the editors were like oh my goodness everything's working now it's cutting together it has energy it's full i mean he's a star for a reason you know um and when we saw him the first piece of music that we wrote we were just like oh man it's robert Downey jr we got to write something awesome so we wrote this big piece of music and they were like hold on now this is just too huge like he's this isn't you're not this isn't iron man like he's just a guy talking um and we had to come up with a bunch of different things and it was actually the combination of Rowan and I together combining like this great 70s style bass and drum groove was the the spark that was the first thing that finally clicked hmm. for Robert on on camera and it becomes like a running theme uh and that kind of energy um, helped carry the whole series where when we would approach things, it was not always like super techy, super heavy, super serious. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily trying to sound like cooking show fun or cooking show exciting. Like um, it's so a different, I guess a different approach. Um, and uh, that's not something I would have done on my own or Ron would have done on his own. And I think that was one of the examples of a true collaborative sort of a great mistake, as if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh I I really can't imagine trying to make music the way that y'all do uh in the 1700s or 1800s or or uh, or earlier, you know, <laughs> prior to prior to sense and being able to uh, you know, hey, try it uh turn the bass up and and do this and do that to, you know, uh, listen to this yeah. song. I just want, you know, I don't want, I don't want to make genuine's pony. I just want the bass out of pony. Let's put it over here. And, uh, right. you know, I can't, I can't it's imagine fine. being back in an era where you've only heard these 10 instruments total and only ever in this particular music tonal system. Uh, I mean, Jacob, you growing up in, uh, or, or doing high school in Japan, I'm sure you, heard music i probably didn't get exposed to until college uh in terms of yep. of oh my gosh there's something beyond western classical music theory uh but you only know what you've heard you know you you your, your imagination is kind of only frequently playing in the bounds of the sandbox as you've pushed it and uh and i can't imagine what uh a crazier stuff beyond sense and beyond uh you know, great effects and more, uh, more software and stuff. Has there been anything that y'all have seen in the series so far, uh, as far as musicians or as far as producers, uh, that's, that's kind of lit a little flame in the, or spark in the back of your, your mind of, of holy crap, what might that lead to in my profession? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I can't, yeah, the, um, the idea of, AI being a composing tool is really fascinating. I think it's a long way off currently from being anything more than sort of a gimmick. You know, like I think Google had that thing, oh yeah, you press this button and you can make it sound like Bach. Um, and the, but the future, you know, I think they talk about it in episode, it might be episode one, um, where, you know, you could say, I'm, I'm working on this track, I need to add a layer, and it needs to be kind of like a Mendelssohn mixed with Hans Zimmer's string ostinato, and the, and the AI maybe will come up with something, yeah. and you could tweak it, oh, make it more triplets and less, you know, you know, it could be like on Star Trek, computer, make it 80% less this, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it, it'll probably not be what you're expecting it, and it'll be like the auto-tune, where it's going to be weird but some kid or some music person is going to say okay i just accept it as a sound 
and ra- rather than trying to make it work as music we currently know, it'll just be something new and different. And that's the reason why I'm glad we scored the show because I think my mindset has changed from, oh yeah, I want to try to figure out how to make AI work within my current workflow. Mm -hmm. Instead, I want to figure, just want to play with it like a kid would play with it and just be like, oh, this is cool and different and then figure out how to just do something new with it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, no spoilers here, um, but there is another episode where AI is used as a um, art, a creative tool um, in an art form adjacent to what we do. Um, I'll leave it at that. There's enough here. Uh-huh. But yeah. what's cool about it is just like we have been saying, is you know, it's not just that this AI is creating art, it's that the humans associated with the art are interpreting this piece, right? So it's it's definitely a collaboration between humans and technology. And that really, you know, that kind of informed me a little bit about how the future can actually exist um, with AI in the music space. Um, and that, you know, kind of similar to chord generators. I, I, I know in the, in the hip hop world, I used to have a, a friend who would always be in a studio who's using chord generators. And at first, man, it would give me the biggest eye roll. Like, come on, guys, can't you learn how to play chords? Like, come on, bro. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then, and then, but then I saw, you know, then my Judgy McJudgerson when I turned it off, and I, I saw how he was using these chord generators as a, a foundation to create new and original ideas very quickly and uniquely. It was like a million happy accidents happening in, in one, you know, one composition, if you will. And it was cool and it was hit, you know? So, you know, to Jacob's point, there will be some kid in some basement or, you know, some professional somewhere making it popular to collaborate with an AI in a unique way that'll yield some results that we can't expect or, or might not even see around the corner. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really at its core, it's not any different than, uh, no, the record's just supposed to play. You're not supposed to scratch it. That's an incorrect sound. Uh, <laughs> right, you know, right, uh, right. You know, I'm not supposed to hear the auto-tune. You're just supposed to use it when you're a hair pitchy. Uh I'm like, oh, well, you know, yep. what if it's what if it's fine that you sound like uh, a synth keyboard for half this song? Uh, sure. Sure. Guitar distortion. Yeah, it, I mean, Even exactly. Dubstep. Think, about, right. think about dubstep, it, dubstep the, the art form. I remember when I first heard dubstep. Like, it took me a second. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this, but the ingenuity to get these sounds and melodies that would not exist together to stand out like this is incredible. And just the production. I don't know if you're familiar with this DJ named Girl Talk. You know, oh yeah, with Girl Talk. Yeah, yeah. So I I kind of stumbled upon Girl Talk in Coachella um, a couple of years back. I I had never a friend of mine had mentioned it, so I, the name was me, but I never heard or seen anything. And seeing this live, it, it's incredible. And for those who don't know Girl Talk, he's just a masterful DJ where he'll mix uh, literally a classical piece with a Beyonce vocal over it. And then he'll drag in like maybe a beat from a silent film on top of that for the rhythm. And he'll just create these pieces that would never exist. And it's not mm. just typical, it's not just typical DJing, it's it's next level. And so mm. that's kind of how yeah. I see, you know, how AI can be. It's like you draw from completely disparate places and make something that would never exist, where you never think to put together. Kind of like what Jacob and I are doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I came to that guy because of some uh, legal nerd friends and what he was doing. I mean, he was making albums that they were like Paul's Boutique. There were so many samples. That there's no conceivable way that he could sell this. Uh, right. And uh, b- because, like you said, it's it's chopped so finely uh, and so integrated that it's just it'll be dozens of songs per song. Um, yeah, there's a there was a documentary called Rip, a remix manifesto that that featured him in it. Uh, and kind of got into that, like, we got to change our attitude about, I mean, I, I remember Puff Daddy first being out when I was in college or getting really big and, and this huge argument about like, is this a new song? Right. You know, if, if he's, what level does he have to transform the original beat? Like how unrecognizable does that original song have to be? If I can pick it out immediately, did he do enough to make it new? 
And at, at this point now, clearly, yes, he did. It, he, he put a new verse over it. I mean, you can just take a Portishead song and rap over it differently, and I'm, I, that's that's fine. But it took an attitude shift in the listenership to to get there, uh, and, and yeah. kind of getting us used to it. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like this stuff's just wild. I thought it was interesting to get to talk to the composers, particularly on this project, uh, just because I I feel like sound production is is an area where tech has been quietly uh, factoring in more and more and more uh, in a way that in a lot of, you know, in a lot of people's lives, maybe it doesn't, you know, their cell phone's the most yeah. advanced thing in their house, but you guys have had pro tools for a while. Uh, <laughs> and that stuff's gotten better yep. and better and better. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Every, every couple of weeks, there's like some new thing and we try to stay very current with it all. In fact, next year, Amazon's got an AI keyboard releasing in the spring um, and then a friend of mine um, has a new software program that um, pairs with your iPhone, and it uses AI to allow you to mix audio by waving your phone around in 3D space. Um, and it reacts, and it does it does interesting things that you wouldn't do otherwise. So it has these really crazy results. Um, and I'm pretty excited to just play with it. You know, I mean, I think the danger for all this new stuff is to try to fit it into a current mindset. And that's the trap. And that's why everyone's scared. And what they need to do is say, no, 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 this needs to be all new. Yeah. Yeah. My, my brain's now just imagining you using a, a Wii controller, like a theremin to conduct an orchestra. Right. Mm-hmm. Amount of, yeah. you know, like a, a dozens or, or hundreds of synth sounds, uh, I want to say somebody at one point built a full body theremin and and got a couple of dancers to try it and no one could friggin make, make it not just scream basically but yeah uh, I bet. but they didn't have a computer ai helping process it um so yeah it's gonna be a wild future yeah. we'll see what happens i'm thank interested you, thank you both so much for taking time to talk to me about it i i went a little bit over what i was expecting i really appreciate it uh yeah y'all have Thanks a great, for having great rest of your day you too. Bye. You too. The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com and electric sweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening.